These Ignite stories are supposed to tell a story. Um, my son Ezra has taught me that if I want him to go to sleep, I better introduce something magical. So we were walking along in the forest and then the pig starts to fly. Um, once upon a time, there was the Hawaii Beer Hour. Every Friday night, it still actually exists. Um, five years ago, James and Todd and I were talking and we said, the conversation devolved to, dude, one day we gotta fly something on a balloon. Um, so then uh, about w five years passed, we had gotten into TLS, uh, following the lead of Gerald Bowden, Unavco has gotten into TLS, there's a large community of this, culminating in this great um, workshop that was here last fall. At the workshop, I was lucky enough to meet the first magical character of the story, Craig Lenny, the, f the fairy godfather. He wouldn't allow me to say the fairy godmother, he's not here. Um, Craig told me the story of a company called Velodyne, which were basically a pair of brothers who had gotten into the high-end acoustics business. They made the best woofers going. They got rich, they got bored, and they started to enter these contests, which you can't see, called BattleBots, Robotica, and Robot Wars. Be, be, be honest, who's ever heard of them or entered those contests? Okay, only a few. Anyway, they, they started to develop lasers to try to win these contests, which were about robotic driving of vehicles. They came up with a multi-element LiDAR to do so, 64 elements. Gradually, that became incorporated into the Google car, the dark character in this story. And, uh, and then Velodyne eventually um, minimized that and made 32 lasers, so portable. This is what the data look like. This is what the Google car sees. In the near field, uh, the things looking down, that's collision avoidance. You have higher density of your lasers. There are, there are 64 of them. In the far field, you have less density uh, because the near field is more important for collision avoidance, obviously. They're small, about the size of a coffee can. Discretionary rebudget allowed me to buy one of these at only 35K, which is about the price that the original Jasper Johns sketch cost of the coffee can, or two of Kobe Bryant shots this year. Just to, <laughs> just, okay. They're eye safe. Uh, they have a measurement range of about 100 meters, um, 10 hertz refresh rate. Uh, the weight is less than two kilograms, so we can get them on a balloon, um, up to 700,000 points per second. Okay, so why, are we, why do we want to do this to begin with? Um, we've all seen the agenda and been at these meetings over the past few years. The geomorphologists and the geodesists are starting to talk more. What they typically talk about is topography. Basically, um, the better topography that geodesists can get, the, geomor the geomorphologists will eat up. They can study more details about uh, rivers forming, about beaches eroding, about landslides slipping, about rocks falling. Um, give them better topography and they'll use it. Okay, getting that topography is hard, often requires militaristic leadership. Uh, the B4 project uh, is a perfect example of that. Beautiful data sets, airborne LiDAR project, covered a massive amount of ground, uh, massive logistic, lo logistics and cost. TLS is also not that easy. Here's an example from the Highway 50 site, Cleveland Corral landslide, we had to go across the, uh, the river valley there about a kilometer away to set up our TLS so we could get good line of sight um, or decent line of sight for that landslide. This is a plot of the data density from that landslide um, and you can see that it's quite variable. There are shadows which are uh, from the trees. Um, the data density itself is quite variable and ideally to do, to do decent analysis we'd like to have uniform data density. We'd like to be airborne. So this is a sketch of what we're actually going to deploy soon. Um, a balloon, an instrument package with two antenna, an IMU uh, uh, computer, and the laser there, which is going to be angled somewhat, flying at 75 meters. We're not showing the cadre of graduate students that we need to actually hold the thing down. Um, a scanning laser, an IMU, which is critical to the whole thing, a camera, a logging laptop, a power source, an ethernet switch. All of this will be airborne and all uh, transmitted wirelessly down to the ground. So we started testing this last week. This was uh, Craig's graduate student. Um, the resolution that we think we can acquire after all the corrections are made in vertical is about five centimeters and in the horizontal is about 10 centimeters. So we think we can get some pretty good, decent data. Um, the system can be put on a backpack as well as a helicopter or as well um, a, as a balloon. This is a, a, a movie of the data in acquisition. Craig is behind his student walking outside. You can see, um, Craig actually is the white, the second dot, white dot behind, and in the far field here, you can see that you're starting to get, as he walks outside, the reflections of the trees. Um, again, Craig is that dot off the radius center, and then the blind spot is um, the student's head, which may or may not say something about the quality of Houston students. Um, okay, so every good story should end uh, happily ever after. The days of Blydar are upon us. 
It's precise, inexpensive, highly portable and mobile bird's eye laser scanning system. Our initial deployment should be in the Sacramento Delta in 2012. Thanks.